First of all, folks, thanks for being with us here today. I really appreciate you sharing your time with us and allowing us to tell Alex's story. Donna, you were the big sister. Mm -hmm. What's your first memory of Alex? Uh, my first memory of Alex, uh, I would say when he was a toddler, uh, he was obsessed with MC Hammer. Um, can't, I think it was Can't Touch This. He just loved the music and he would just dance around. We have a ton of family videos. That's really my earliest memory. I just remember him dancing and knowing the words at a young age. So I'd say that was probably the funniest story <laughs> I can remember. And Nate, do you remember when you met him? Uh, throughout high school, I knew of him. Uh, there was different cliques in the school we went to. And then when we graduated, uh, we became very, very close, like the year after we graduated high school up until uh, last year. And Katie, do you remember when you first met Alex? Mm -hmm. So I actually met Alex through Donna. Mm -hmm. So Donna, friends with Donna first, and that's how I met him. So yeah, so it's actually a funny story because we, <laughs> we met way back, like 13, 14 mm -hmm. years ago. Um, I went on a date with him to New York City. Um, we spent the day together, and actually it didn't end up working out. We went our separate ways after that date, and then reconnected about mm, three or four years later. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Why did you think your brother was good for Katie? My brother was good for Katie because Katie and I are really similar, and he and I get al got along really well. And I think, you know, he's just, uh, he's, he just has that... Uh, masculine man <laughs> attitude and uh, I think it just resonated for Katie. So it wasn't life at first, your love at first sight rather? No, I was in a, a relationship at the time and I think I was just wrapped up in that and um, I was going through something and I ended up going back to that and then that didn't work out. So I think it was just being in a difficult place at that time and um, not ready um, and then taking some time for myself reconnecting with Donna. We, we stayed in touch anyway. And then I would see Alex, which was interesting because I would go to parties and stuff and he would be there. And I always thought he was a wonderful person. I just, it, you know, it took some time to just for us to reconnect. And then from there, it was awesome. So. And Nate, what did he first tell you about Katie after he met her? Uh, I knew a lot about Katie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We talked a lot. Um, yeah, we shared a lot of good secrets. Matter of fact, same idea is when I first met my wife, Alex was the first person I ran and told. So we told each other about our, our lady friends a lot. So. <laughs> Did he say, I've met the woman I'm going to marry? Oh, geez. Don't put me on the spot like that. <laughs> Come on. Um, uh, no. <laughs> no, he didn't. No, he didn't. Let's go back to when Alex was in high school and growing up. What kind of kid was he like? After the MC Hammer phase. Yeah. Um, so he he was, I would say, he didn't love school. He wasn't, he wasn't made for school. He was definitely one that just loved to have a good time and was just like very fun loving. Um, so I think school sort of felt like constricting for him. I mean, he was so smart, but he... I guess he just wasn't really interested in the, in the routine and the schedule of school. Um, but he was a rambunctious kid. He had a lot of energy. And I see so much of him in my four-year-old now, like knowing what my mom went through, I can totally relate to, to all of that. And how old was he when you met him, Katie? The first, like that first... That first time. Oh, 20? I feel like we were probably... Maybe 20 or 21, because we actually, um, when we got back together when we reconnected we were 25 so I would say yeah 21 probably so when you reconnected that time when did you realize he was the one I, I just knew I knew I always just had this feeling about him and and we went on our first and well technically second date from the, <laughs> and it just I don't know from there it was I felt like I knew him forever that's really the feeling I got and he felt the same way it, you just you just know like I felt like he was my soulmate and tell me about how he proposed um so we have this place in the Berkshires called Lee Mass I don't know if you've heard of it um, little small town um, uh, for his birthday I decided uh, when we had first started dating I wanted to take him somewhere Alex was a very simple person he didn't like like crazy big 
things, you know, he just like sim simple stuff to him meant so much. So I was like, where can we go? That's like just quaint and, and just a place for us to get away. And so my mom had helped me and said, hey, the Berkshires are beautiful. It's not too far. And there's a place called Lee and his birthday is in December. So it's, it's, it snows, you know, it's around Christmas time. And so she said, I think it would be a great place. So we went there. Alex loved it. And there's really not much to do there, to be honest. It's just this little town and we just did our thing. And we just, we love to just go to dinner and spend time together, find a nice coffee shop to just sit and talk. And, and then we went there every year after that. We, it was just our, we, well, first we, we were New England vacationers, period. We didn't, we stayed in New England and we just enjoyed doing the same thing year after year. And so entering Lee, there's this massive sign that says, you know, entering Lee, and it's got this beautiful scenic area. And so we would stop there and take a picture in front of the sign. And um, if you look on my social media page, you'll see a lot of that every year. It's a different photo. And Alex was the best at taking selfies. He was just the best. He's like, give me that, give me that camera, you know? And he was like, the, he was just so good at it. I'm like, okay. And so, yeah, that's how he proposed. He, um, I had no idea. We stopped to take our photo. And actually, funny story is, I, he had bought me several coats for Christmas gifts and he was very specific on wearing a specific coat. And I was like, why do you care what coat I'm gonna wear, right? <laughs> and so he, cause he knew, he thought, you know, and so I ended up wearing that coat and I just thought it was so strange that he was so like, wear that, I want you to wear that coat. Well, it's for the photo, obviously. And so we, and it was freezing cold that day. Like, I mean, the wind was blowing, it was like, uh, freezing and so in the car I'm telling him we don't have to get that photo I, it's too cold and he's like no we're gonna get and there he's freaking out because this is his whole plan on how to propose and I'm literally ruining it and he's so nervous already and I, he's like no we're gonna take it you know who cares this is a quick photo and I was laughing at, laughing after the fact because I realized oh my gosh that whole time he's like oh my god I wanted to kill you like I was like you know and so we walked through the snow and we went to go take the picture and it's, it's windy and I'm like, okay, let's go. And then he, he said, wait, wait, wait. And we turned around and he was kneeling in the snow. So that was the proposal. Yeah. In front of the Lee, Massachusetts yeah. sign. <laughs> so he was a romantic. Yeah. He was in his own way. Oh yeah, very much so in his own way. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I'll throw it there to whoever wants to answer this first, but it, when did he decide he wanted to be a police officer? Who remembers that? Well. For me, when I met him, when we started dating, he was not a police officer, but he was trying to be, and that was... I think he talked about it, right? Yeah. As soon as we graduated high school, yeah. he wanted to be a police yeah. officer. Yeah, I would say he was just always called to service. I think he just yeah. wanted he wanted to be in the uh, the Coast Guard. He, I think he's the Coast Guard or the National Coast Guard, Guard. Coast, Coast Guard. Guard. And he ended up figuring out that he had a seafood allergy or shellfish allergy, so he couldn't <laughs> yeah. serve in the Coast Guard. So he was just always, you know, wanting to do mm -hmm. something to serve. So I think the b policing was just that. And he always made it a point. I remember him always making it a point that he wanted to serve in Bristol. He always wanted to be on That's the true. Bristol Police Department. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I think it's just because he grew up here or he had his roots here, he had his parents here, he had his family here. Mm -hmm. He wanted to protect and serve Bristol, Connecticut. Everybody who we talked to loved Alex Hamsey in Bristol. Mm -hmm. What did Bristol mean to him? Man, I... I think it's just where he grew up. I mean, my parents are immigrants. They came here, you know, and they, this is where they decided to stay. Um, so that meant something to him. He was really about family and just, you know, or, our origin and our heritage. And my parents were really important to him. So I just think it just was where his friends were, where his life was. I mean, he was also a really social guy. And we owned a restaurant for a long time in downtown Bristol. So and he was the toast guy, so he was on the line, and it was, you know, the counter was right there, so he just met all of these old-time Bristol, you know, folks that would come in, and it was, I think, just meant something to him, just to have those connections. Do you remember the day he graduated from the academy? Or um, the, the, the graduation. day, yes, or the day he became a police officer? Yes. Sure. Well, yeah, I remember him in the police academy because he would leave. I only saw him on the weekends. And I remember him getting his bag ready and, you know, rolling up his clothes and putting them in this bag that, you know, and it was like, it was just so crazy because I'm like this, okay, see you next weekend. I mean, we would talk when he could yeah. talk, which was not often because they were so strict with like being able to talk and on the phone. But yeah, I do remember that. I remember him just seeing him on the weekends for a while. Did he love being an officer? 
Right? Uh, yeah, like they've, like they've alluded to already. I mean, he was built to serve. I've only seen him in uniform once. So I knew the personal side of Alex. I never knew Officer Hamsey. And to me, there's a big difference there. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I knew Alex and he was just a, a decent human being. Um, but yeah, he was, um, I saw pictures of him at the parade <laughs> and at places in the uniform and stuff like that. But I used to always tease him because I'm prior law enforcement in Maine. And so, I, and he wanted to get in the Coast Guard and mm -hmm. I was in the Coast Guard. And so I always used to say like, quit riding my coattails, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, How uh, excited was he when he got hired by the Bristol PD? Oh my gosh. Oh. Oh, he was so yeah. excited. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It was like a dream come true mm -hmm. for him, I think. I remember him making a comment about wanting to, you know, some people run away from different problems. And I, I remember him saying like he wanted to be a part of the change of Bristol, like to make it better and to do things mm -hmm. in, within the city to instead of abandoning ship, he wanted to make it better. And I think he did that every day. Mm -hmm. So every day when he went off to work, what did he say to you usually? You know, uh, was, was he excited to serve? Yeah, I mean, it was in the beginning he worked third. So, I mean, it was it was hard because sleep schedule, getting used to that. He did that for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, I never, you know, Alex, it was just, he would just, I mean, he never had his uniform on. He always left in normal clothes and got dressed at the station. So um, he would just give me a kiss goodbye, you know, see you later, you know, just go to work. It was... Yeah, he never complained. He never, he just loved what he did. He loved what he did. He really did. He must have had some tough days though when he came home and he had a tough day or like a sad day or something. Mm, with. Yes, but Alex wasn't one to bring his problems home mm -hmm. from work. A lot of people do that, but not Alex. He, he, he just, he never wanted to, I don't know, like let his problems be other people's problems, if that makes sense. That, that wasn't Alex. So yeah, I could tell if he had a, a rough day, um, but we didn't talk, really talk about it. It was more just like doing the things we enjoyed while he was home to kind of get his mind off of any of that. I was also told that he was one of those guys who helped people even when, when he wasn't on oh the job. <laughs> yeah, I think Katie could probably tell you. Like, oh how my gosh. That was. Yeah, yeah, Alex, um, it, for the people he loved, he would do absolutely anything. I mean, and even for people that just he had in his life, friends, you know, he, Alex was that person. He, it didn't matter. He, he just did things for people without ever wanting anything in return. It didn't matter. It was just who he was as a person, you know, and sometimes he, you know, would lack on the things he wanted to get done for himself because he would be so into getting things done for everybody else. And so... I kind of said to him, you know, I obviously love you for the fact that that's, you know, you are that person, but you also need to sometimes think about you, you know, because um, it was just hard at times because he couldn't say no to people. He loved to help people. He loved to, you know, and, and people knew that about Alex. They knew that he would say yes, you know, like, hey, man, can you help me move today? Hey, can you help me fix this? And the thing about Alex is like, he was a jack of all trades. He knew how to do anything. Like... And I think it stems from his previous jobs too. I mean, he had several jobs. He was an iron worker. He was a framer. He was a he waterproof basements. He did landscaping. I mean, he did it all. Right. And he really and people knew that about him because not everyone has that talent of being able to just know how to do things, sure. right? And I think he would express to people that he knew, but not in a way of trying to brag that, oh yeah, I could do this. It was just more of Alex. Like, yeah, dude, I, I have waterproof basements. I'll come waterproof your basement. You know, like it was a very like, it's, it's from, he had the biggest heart of anybody I've ever known. What did he do to relax, to have fun? <laughs> oh, boy. I don't know if I can tell those stories. No, he. I don't. I don't know. I just had a different, same idea though about not bringing the problems home. I never. I try to think about a time when I would call Alex and he was upset or he would complain. So he never really needed to unwind. I mean, even when he came to Maine for cornhole tournaments or whatever we were doing, he showed up in a good mood, always. He did. He did love cars, BMWs to be exact. Sure. He was a real like obsessed about cars. He ended up buying like I think one of his dream cars, like a vintage BMW, um, probably two years ago. So he had a lot of good hobbies. Mm -hmm. He also loved the outdoors. I would say oh, yeah, he was a just a lot huge of hiker. hiking. This was our time of year. Yeah. We loved to hike. We went up to Killington every year and we hiked. And 
yeah, he was, he liked, yeah, he loved to be outdoors, but definitely very outdoorsy person. Donna, do you remember your last conversation with, with Alex? Alex, that was a tough moment. Um, we would talk often. I mean, he, when he was on duty, he would just call and FaceTime um, because my, as I mentioned before, I have a four-year-old son and he was just very close to him. Um, so he would, and my son just loved to see him in uniform. I mean, again, he's my brother and I, I, He's Alex to me, he's not Alex the police officer, but for my son, it was like the coolest thing to see him in uniform. So he would just always, I think the last time I spoke to him was like him FaceTiming us from the cruiser. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm just gonna stop there. Okay, you know, Katie, do you remember your last conversation? You know, with Alex? He got to the hard question. <laughs> yeah, we can come back, we can come back. We can, come back. <laughs> yeah, no, we can totally come back, no, no worries, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, okay. Um. So we had actually, um, Columbus Day weekend was our weekend to go to Killington, Vermont, and I still remember getting back from this most vivid memory is Vermont, and him telling me he was going to have a busy week because he had a lot of training for SWAT, and um, yeah, I actually to be honest with you, I did not get to see, I saw Monday we got back from Vermont and we, we never, we said our vacation is not over until it's actually, till the next day. So we would always like get back from our little trip and then we'd order pizza. It was like our thing to do. So we ordered a pizza and we were just hanging out on the couch. I remember him being like, oh man, this week is going to be tough. I have so much, I have training and stuff. And um, he's like, I'm just, I'm going to have to leave early because when he had training, he would literally go to training at like 7 a.m and then do his training and then go into his shift for second shift. So I wouldn't see him all day. And sometimes if I went to bed earlier, we, we never ended up seeing each other. And that's kind of what happened. Um, I saw him Monday night. We had a great night. And Tuesday, he got up super early. I was still in bed. He left. Um, he came home. I was already in bed. It was like we were just not seeing each other. And then Wednesday came. I remember hearing him leave. Um, we had texts throughout the day, of course. Um, he had called me earlier that day. And yeah, I, I, that was really, I, I, for me, my most vivid memory of when I actually spent time with him was that Monday night. Because we had just gotten back from Vermont and we ordered a pizza and we were just hanging out and watching our shows. And so yeah, that, um, but yeah, that's really, that's it. Um, October 1st, uh, him and uh, our other good friend, Jim, Jimmy Wozniak, Drove, they, the two of them, Alex and Jimmy, drove up to Maine on a Saturday. I was hosting a cornhole tournament at the Veterans Club I'm a part of. And I'll, my vivid memory is that next day I had to go watch my daughter play field hockey. And Jimmy and Alex decided to stay another night, Sunday night going into Monday. And I'll never forget, I looked at my wife and I said, I'm going back to Portland because Jimmy and Alex are staying another night. <laughs> and she's like, no, you're not. And I was like, well. <laughs> I'm married to you for life, and Jimmy and Alex are in Portland. I'm going back to I'm going back to Portland. So I kissed my daughters that night, and uh, I went back to Portland. And we had a we had a really good fun time. It was I think some football was on. Mm -hmm. uh, we watched some football games Sunday night, uh, and then they took off. Uh, I went home Monday. So you Facetimed with them that day from the cruiser. Yes, that day yeah, we did Facetime from the cruiser. He was talking to your son. He was. Yep. Yeah, as he often did, as I mentioned, like Grayson just loved his uncle. Um, so. What do you remember from later that night? Um, <laughs> that was a difficult night, yeah, for sure. I was actually putting Grayson down to bed um, when I got the phone call from Katie about um, what had happened. Um, so it was more just, you know, panic, obviously, and just not believing what she said until an officer confirmed on the phone. But it was just getting to my parents. I just remember that was like my main focus is making sure that my parents were okay. I'm sorry. That's okay, that's okay. We, we can take a break. Yeah. My mom had just left for Virginia. My sister lives there and my sister was traveling that next week to go to Aruba and she was there to watch her, her son. So she traveled all the way to Virginia that day and um, so my father had already been at the police station when I met him. Um, and then I had to tell my mom and sister over the phone. Um, so that was really hard to do. Did they call you, Katie, or did they come to the house? Um, they came to the house. 
um, it, it, it's kind of a, like, I don't remember. Like, I just remember getting a call from one of the police officers that was very close to Alex and basically him saying, I need you to, because I was in bed at the time. I was exhausted. I went to bed earlier that night and um, the, my phone was ringing and I'm like, and I see it's who, you know, one of the police officers and he picks, I pick up and he goes, listen, there's two cops, you know, that are going to be sh- coming to your door. I need you to answer the door. And I was like, what? I was so confused. He's like, listen, I just need you to answer the door. Just answer the door. And then before I know it, I just remember hearing someone knocking at the door. Um, and that's really all I remember. I just remember opening the door and there was two police officers, officers who, um, yeah, were there. And that's really all I remember. I don't, I can't, I, it was a state of sh- complete shock. That's all I know. And I just remember calling Donna. It was the first person I thought to call. Um, and I don't even remember the conversation. I really don't, it's, I don't remember any of it. Nate, do you remember how you found out? Yeah, I got a phone call at midnight. And again, I live in Maine, so uh, when people from home call me at midnight, I don't know, I, like I didn't pick up the phone. And he called me back twice, three times, and so I knew something was important, and uh, I was told that he was involved in an incident. Um, and I packed my bags and drove home. That night, I left about, I don't know, three or four in the morning, three in the morning. Is it, as this date approaches Thursday night, what are your thoughts as you look to to Thursday? So the goal in doing this really was just to make sure that, you know, people understood who Alex Hamsey was. And it, for me, and I think I can speak for my family when I say that October 12th obviously will forever be a day that we want to forget. It's not a day that you know we want to necessarily reflect upon, but it's it's important for us that we we remember him and celebrate Alex and make sure that all the chaos that surrounds this day, um, because of how public it was, isn't the focus in in our opinion. It's it's about who Alex was, the life he lived, and how much he meant to us. So I think that's what I think about as we approach that day. How did you get through those next few days and the funeral? Because you, you showed such tremendous courage. So Donna and I talk about that. Um, I, I mean, I truly believe that. So my belief is Alex is always going to be with us. I, I don't believe that you just, you're gone. That's it. That's not my belief. So uh, Alex was a very strong person. <laughs> Another level of strong. And... Um, I believe he helped us through that. I really do. I believe he gave, because I look back and I'm like, we look back. We're like, how did we do that? Mm-hmm. How were we able to even function and, you know, and and, and get up there and, and just speak and, and be part of all of that? And I believe it was him. I really do. I believe he gave us his strength to do to do that. You know, I believe what you believe. Oh, did, do you, did you talk to him daily? I talk to him, I talk to him every day. Every day. Yeah, 100% I talk to him every day. I, yeah. So you're missing one key point, though, is <laughs> your question about October 12th. Talking to the fam- Alex's family and his wife, they deal with this every day. Yeah. October 12th is not just a day that comes around as an anniversary or a once-a-year type of thing. It's Monday through Monday, 24-7. It's got to be the toughest thing to deal with in the world in their shoes. Um, so, do you see signs during the day, sometimes? <laughs> so yeah, that I can really get into. So I, I will <laughs> never, I will never learn to live without Alex. I hate that that term. Like you learn to, you know, he will forever be part of my life. I'm just learning how to live with that love because he was love, so much love, and so I just learned to live with that in different in a different way, and it's not easy because he's physically not here, but he lets me know very often that he's here. Signs that I can't even, so many signs, it's it's unbelievable. Um, And that is really what gives me the, it's a comforting feeling, even though it can be frustrating at times because, you know, I can't see him. Um, it, It helps me, it really does. He is, he truly is like light in my in this dark time he is my 
and of course the support from my family and stuff, but I'm alone a lot. You know, I'm in the space that we shared and it's, it's, it's a comforting thing. But for me, I spent, I have a lot of alone time. And so without having that feeling of knowing he's with me, I'm not sure where I would be. Is it difficult or comforting when you drive around town and you see the signs and, and Difficult. And like that? So I, I try to avoid Bristol, to be honest. I don't, I go to see my in-laws. As it's just a constant reminder of that. To me, I never look at that photo of Alex in the uniform. I don't. It's not how I remember him. I look at photos from us on our wedding day and in Vermont and him with Gizmo and my, our dog. And I thought those are the those are the memories that make me laugh and make me feel a feeling of just not it, it's painful, but it's a feeling of love. Like I don't feel that feeling when I look at that photo of him. It's not the I will I don't have police stuff all over my house. I have the photos that we shared our memories, our happy memories together. That, like Nate said, I, I don't think of Alex, I know that's what he did for, as a, you know, he was a police officer, we all know that, but that's not how I think of him. That's not how I think of him. <laughs> you have to humanize the badge. I mean, these police officers that are out there that defend and put their life on the line for us all the time, those are human beings. Those are wives, husbands, sons, sisters, brothers. There's a person behind that uniform, and I wish people would wake up to that fact. So, what should we remember about Alex Hamsey, the person? We all know about his police career. <laughs> that he was, he was so much more than that. He was love. I mean, he was just such a, oh my, a heart like you. He was, yeah, he was the true meaning behind what love is. I mean, he gave without ever wanting anything in return. He, he was just an all around, like, amazing human being he really was i mean not to say that we never had you know it was this perfect thing all the time of course we've we had arguments and disagreements at times but he was just really an amazing person amazing person and anyone that truly knew alex knows that they know it they just know it how do you get through your day donna um, i mean you think about him all the time of course yeah i think um my life just keeps you busy i think the the thing that stinks in grief is that life doesn't stop when you're grieving someone you've lost. So it's a lot of just picking up and moving and doing what you have to do, um, sort of with laser focus. And it just, there are moments when, you know, it's jarring. When I see a photo of him, um, it just brings me back to that moment that I discovered what had happened to him. Um, but I think just getting through the day is just really remembering those memories of him and his laugh. Like, I can just hear his laugh in my head often um, because he was just, he was like my big brother. He really was. Like, he was the youngest of the three of us, but he was like my big brother. Like, I leaned on him. I, you know, sometimes I, it's hard to, I get through a day and I remember that I can't call him as a favor or like to ask a question or, you know, how something works. Like, so it's hard. It's a hard to thing to, to describe. Do you ever talk to Laura DeMonte at all? I do. Is that um, comforting? Yes. So Laura and I are forever connected. And we say that to each other all the time. We are. Um, and I think that, you know, Laura and I, um, going same thing happened to us. But, like, when it comes to grief, it's so different for each person. Um, and Laura and I talk about that because we're in, you know, different situations. She has three children. <laughs> Alex and I didn't get to have a family. Um, so we talk about that. You know, we, we it's, sometimes it's just, it, there's a lot of things that can be frustrating too. Like people mean well, you know, they want to, they want to help. They want to, they want to make it better, you know, but unfortunately in grief, you can't make it better. You can't take that pain away, you know? And so sometimes the things people say to us, or, um, you know, they, they, it can be aggravating, you know, and it's, and we, we know, and it's a difficult situation because we know that they mean well, we know it's all with good intentions, but sometimes it's just a lot and it's overwhelming. And so for her and I to just vent to each other and kind of just talk about things and to relate and say, oh my gosh, I know, I, I feel that way too, you know, to know that it's okay. Our feelings are valid, you know, it, they are, they're valid and it's not wrong to get, you know, frustrated or angry or upset, you know, like, 
it, because it, it's difficult for people because especially the people that love and care for you, they want to do, they feel hopeless. They want to help. They want to make it better, but you can't make this better. You can't fix what happened, you know? So it's difficult. And, you know, I, I read a lot of things about grief because unfortunately our society is very uneducated on grief. There's a, like Donna said, you know, everyone gets back into the, you know, their life, right? The world just keeps moving, but for like me anyway, like I feel like my world has stopped. It has stopped and it hasn't changed since, you know, in a year. Just because a year has went by doesn't mean that my pain is less. It doesn't mean that I'm doing better. Um, it's a journey. Grief is a journey and it's navigating this. And some days are better, I guess, than others. But then it is like I read about like they, they describe grief as like waves, right? Like you, you, the water is calm and you're kind of feeling OK. And then all of a sudden this wave comes crashing down. And it's true. You could be like I, I've been doing dishes and I'm just, you know, all of a sudden it just hits me. And it's this gut wrenching indescribable pain and you just it just it's I, I I don't wish that upon anyone you know when when people say I, I could never imagine well, I hope you never have to be in this because it is there's grief but there's also traumatic grief and it's not the same and I've heard people say I, I know people who think that grief is all the same it's not it's so that's so very far from the truth and it and it's so different for each person too. And it's it's messy and it's it's complicated and time doesn't change anything. I, I don't like the saying time heals all wounds. This is a this is a wound that can't be healed, if that makes sense. Like it's not something that's just gonna close up and it's gonna go away. Like this will forever be part of my life, you know? It doesn't matter now and you know. 30 years, 40, however long I live, I will forever, I will never not think about Alex. I will never th not think about what happened. I will, the pain will never be less. It may be, you know, longer periods of time where I don't have those waves crash, but when they crash, the pain is just as strong. It's just as, it's like it just happened. And that's what I think people just don't understand. And I don't expect them to, if you've never experienced something like this why why would you you know um and i think for like me and i think it's different for any everyone but like i don't know what my, each day holds you know i don't know how i'm gonna be where i'm gonna be you know and so i tell people the only way the only thing i could tell you is if you can just meet me where i'm at it's the only it's the only way it's gonna work because i can't promise you that i'm gonna be you know in a good place today an hour from now, you know what I mean? Like it changes. It's so grief is such a crazy thing. It really is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> is is it possible for you to have a good day? At the end of the day, do you say I had a good day today, or or, or none of them good? I, I don't use the word good. Um, I had a better day. You know, I had a better day, and so better means that maybe. I thought about Alex, you know, and I didn't cry, but I smiled because he, I thought about him and it wore, it just brought a feeling of comfort and I was, and then, you know, I don't know how to describe it. And then other days I'm just a mess. You know, I, I'm foggy, I'm crying. I'm, I maybe don't want to get out of bed one day and that's okay. You know what I mean? It, there's no right or wrong to grief and there's definitely no time frame in grief. People yeah. like to rush grief. They want to, oh, you should be better. That's not how it works. It's not. And, and like I said, I know people mean well and all the support, it's, it's so it, it appreciated. But then again, there are some days where I don't really want to talk to anyone and that's okay too, you know? And Laura and I talk about this because it just, for Laura, it's tough because she's so busy all the time with her three children that she doesn't, sometimes she doesn't get the time to grieve, you know? And that's, that's, that's a lot to, 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 to take in every single day so you have family here for, for support yes yes yeah i mean are they how helpful have they been in terms of you getting through this journey as best you can so i always say that my bubble is very small i feel like i'm in a bubble and that bubble is so tiny and i'm gonna keep it that way i know that there are people that i could call and they would be there but for me there's just those people that i go to that i feel comfortable and um talking to and it's, you know, yeah, they're very, very helpful, um, but the bubble is small <laughs> and I'm not ready to expand that yet. I just, I'm not there yet. And people understand, they do, they, they understand. 
I want to ask you a little bit about Alec Ayarado. Have What kind of relationship has developed since that night? I'll start with you, Donna. Um, to be honest, I think Alec was going through his own trauma. I mean, I can't speak for him, but I, I, I don't think there was ever on my family's behalf an expectation of him. Sure. Um, this, he's the one who survived. You know, he's the one who, you know, made that fatal shot. I think ultimately, like, he was wounded too. So there was a, just as much of a journey for him. And I think um, we haven't had a lot of interaction, I'll be honest. Uh, but that's nothing that, yeah. we, you know, we, we have any Ill, Ill feelings about. I think ultimately, you know. I've met him. He's very quiet. And, yeah. You know, yeah, he's very nice, very nice awesome. person. And, 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 you know, I can't even begin to understand what he's, exactly. right. you know. Um, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't include? I did want to mention. I know you mentioned that, like, just driving around Bristol, and if if yes, it's yes, if yes. it's if it's, it's I I don't know that it. I I want to be clear that I think it's really important for us to just to, to highlight how incredibly grateful. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think gratitude really says how grateful we are for the um, level of support. I think the community of Bristol is just. Incredible. I, mean, I grew up here, and uh, you know, I lived in my own little bubble, to use your words. Um, so to see just how expansive the um, support and community like has been around us, and you know, the, the big arms they've placed around us. I, I want to be clear that that to us, like when I see a blue light, like it, it sucks. <laughs> I'll be honest, if I, in immediate, in, immediately. But I'm grateful because it means that these people understand that we're a community and they're they're grieving too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understandably, you'll be mourning privately on Thursday night. Yes. Together. Yes. Do, do we, we're going to be at the vigil. Sorry to interrupt you. But oh, you will be at the vigil. I, okay. I will be at the vigil with my mom and my father will also be there. But. Yeah. I'm not sure Katie's made a decision on that yet. That's but a tough yeah, thing to yeah. be at. No, I totally understand. Um, what kind of talks have you had? What kind of memorial would you like to see a permanent one? Or does that matter? Yeah, I would say um, for the memorial, I, again, tremendous gratitude. And for the police force, they're grieving too. They have been grieving. It's, it's a loss for them. Just like you know, it's a loss for the community. I think to, to memorialize them and to provide an opportunity and a place to memorialize, God forbid, this happens again, or, you know, officers just in general, I think it's, it's, I think it's a wonderful, like, uh, sentiment. Yeah. Do you ever imagine what he's doing right now in his... He's sitting right over yeah, there. Yeah. He's listening. He's listening. He's he's <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. I told him to come. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a joke. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for for talking with us today. I know it wasn't easy, and um, you know all of us are. You know, I don't even know what we can do. But um, thank you. If there's anything else, is there anything else we missed, or anything you want to talk about about Alex? We need to know about or. No, I can't really talk about Alex after, uh, after all of our stories. Yeah. No, I think just <clears throat> round, rounding up by saying that you know he he was like the most selfless, fearless, awesome person. I think it sounds so cliche to talk about people in death. Obviously, sometimes you memorialize them and make them bigger than they are, but we're not doing that. Like, I really can't express how, how much that is the case. Uh, I have voicemails on my phone. Whenever I called Alex, he picked up the phone and he didn't say hello. It was always a giggle. It was always yeah, a laugh. Exactly. <laughs> he had this like, <laughs> he had this like, I'm not gonna do it, but he just had this laugh. It, you know, you pick up the phone, he was laughing. Yeah. It's like, and you could feel it through the phone. It's like she was talking about that love. That energy that I've been learning about this whole high frequency <laughs> energy stuff, but uh, that energy, you could feel it through the phone. And, and it was real. It was weird. Mm -hmm. Totally weird. I see his smile on Donna, do you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there, yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah, of course. Beautiful smile. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.